I want to welcome you to our video on what to expect now that your federal case has been filed. My name is John Watts and I'm one of the partners at Watson Herring in Birmingham, Alabama. And this uh, material that we're going to go over is some material that we have provided to our clients over the years and we thought it might be helpful to have this in a video format as well. Now we also realize that sometimes people who have not hired a lawyer uh, may still have questions about what to expect once they file a case in federal court. Maybe they're thinking about filing a case. And so we wanted to make that available uh, to those folks as well. So, uh, But understand that our primary purpose is for our own clients and we'll be uh, talking from our standpoint, our perspective, and uh, we're going to keep this about an hour uh, or less and so there's a lot of things that we will not cover just for the sake of time and, and we're also not going to get bogged down in every exception to the exception to the exception. So glad that you're here and hope that you find this to be very helpful to you. I want to give you our contact information and Stan Herring will be your primary uh, lawyer on the case. He's in charge of our litigation and you can reach him at our main number 205-879-2447. Uh, the second number is his direct dial, 205-714-4443. You can also reach me. Again, my name is John Watts. You can reach Melissa Pierce, our legal assistant. And you can also email us, and we have our email addresses uh, on the screen. So here's how we would like for you to use this overview of the litigation process in federal court. And if you're a client of ours, then you should have this uh, presentation uh, that's been printed out and mailed to you. We want you to be able to read through this, write down any questions, any thoughts that you have, and then get back with us on those because the whole point of this is to help you to understand the process so that you'll feel very comfortable with what is happening. So let's start off with step one and we have a total of eight steps to the process. Step one is simply the lawsuit or the complaint. So you have filed a federal court lawsuit, and this is known as the complaint, and you file that against the defendant. Now, we have cases where we sue multiple defendants. In this presentation, we're just going to assume that there's one defendant just to keep things uh, simple. So what does that complaint actually do? Well, first of all, we want you to read over the stamp file complaint. That means a complaint that we actually filed into court it comes back to us and it has a little stamp on it that says when it was filed. You should have a copy of that that will be mailed to you. And what we're telling the federal court, a number of things we're saying to the judge, I just want to highlight three. First of all, who you are. So who's this person that has filed the lawsuit? And who is the defendant that has been sued? So we identify who the defendant is. And then, what did that defendant do wrong? So we put in a complaint facts, and we put what the defendant did or did not do. We don't put everything, but we put what is required under the law to give a good uh, understanding of what we say the defendant did wrong. And then we put in some legal theories and put in what we are entitled to recover as compensation or other damages from the defendant. So, okay, what happens after the complaint's filed? So you're holding the complaint in your hands. What happens next? Well, the federal court is going to serve the lawsuit on the defendant. And that means to send a copy of the lawsuit to the defendant. Now, that could be the defendant directly. If it's a person, that's what it normally is. If it's a corporation, there's usually somebody called a registered agent, and that is the person or company that's designated to receive the papers. And normally that's done by certified court uh, when we file cases here in Alabama federal court. Well, what happens after that defendant gets served? Well, now the clock starts ticking. Now there is a time limit involved. And that time limit is normally 21 days to respond after the defendant was served. Now, a lot of times they'll ask for additional time. It may be the lawyers get, the, get a copy of the lawsuit on day 20 or 21. 
So we'll give them additional time to file an answer. Sometimes, though, uh, instead of filing an answer, they want to file a motion to dismiss, and we normally do not give them any extra time to file that. But they're either going to file an answer or a motion to dismiss. So that takes us to step two. So what, what is an answer? What is a motion to dismiss? Well, we'll start with a motion to dismiss. This is pretty rare that this happens, but if it does, we want you to be prepared for it. It's where the defendant says to the federal court, look, there is no way that the plaintiff, that's you, can win. So just get rid of the case now. We don't have to spend any more time on it. Now, this won't surprise you. We don't file cases we think will be dismissed, so we respond to the motion to dismiss and say, no, this case should not be thrown out of court. It's a valid case, a legitimate case, and then we wait till the judge rules on it. Depending on the judge and how long it takes, uh, everything may stop until the judge rules or other things may proceed. It just depends on uh, exactly what has happened. So let's talk about worst case scenario, the case is dismissed. That's because a judge feels there's just no way you can be successful. Now, we only file cases that we feel good about, that we are confident will not be dismissed. So if one is dismissed, that would be very surprising to us, and we'd sit down and talk to you about what your options are. But normally, when anybody has filed a motion to dismiss that is unsuccessful, and the judge will deny it, and then the judge says, all right, now you've got X number of days to file your answer. So let's talk about that. What is an answer? Well, it's the legal response to your complaint. So we may get a phone call, we may get an email, we may get a letter that says, oh, this is outrageous and we didn't do anything wrong. That doesn't mean anything. What matters is what does that defendant, through its lawyer, file in response? What does it file in court? Now, it can admit our allegations, the paragraphs, the things that we put into a lawsuit. It's very unlikely. Uh, we've had companies that have sued our client and then lost, and then we put in the lawsuit, you sued my client in small claims court, and they'll deny that. They'll say, well, we don't have enough information to know, which kind of makes you wonder, why wouldn't they know when they've sued somebody? Or maybe it's a, there's been a car wreck, and they may deny that the car wreck happened, okay? But the better companies and the ones that have the better lawyers will admit the things that should be admitted. Uh, still, it's unlikely that that happens. They almost always deny everything, though. Whether they should or shouldn't do that's another matter. But when they deny it, that means you have to prove it. Now, they'll also put in every possible thing that's called an affirmative defense. Okay, So what is that? That's where the defendant says, okay, all right, you caught me. I did it, but I'm not responsible because of blank, and that's the affirmative defense. It might be statute of limitations, it might be you've already settled with the defendant, or you filed bankruptcy and did not notify the court. It could be they say this is all your fault. Even though we're at fault too, you're at fault and so you can't win. It's whatever they can put in there. Now this does not surprise us, this is very typical. We're just bringing this up because we want you to know what this is when you see it because you're going to see they'll just be page after page. It's amazing. A company that, that uh, let's say it's a debt collector that's been calling you. They'll say, well, we deny that we called you, but then they'll spend 12 pages saying, but even if we did call you, we're not responsible. So uh, it's another matter of whether they should be doing all these affirmative defenses. The judges are getting more strict about saying, wait a minute, only put legitimate stuff in there. But that's something we'll take care of in court. We just want you to know what it is when you see it. Now, what happens after an answer is filed? Well, we need to get a scheduling order. And a scheduling order is the uh, process or the deadlines of what will happen, when things will happen, and when we're going to try the case, when certain deadlines are. So to do that, we first meet with the lawyers and then we submit a report to the court 
giving a proposed scheduling order. So that's our next step, step three. We got to get that scheduling order from the court. So after that answer, we meet with the lawyer. This is called the party planning meeting. And this is not something that uh, you need to be there. We take care of that for you. We meet with the other lawyers. We lay out deadlines. Normally, we can agree on everything. But if we cannot, then we say, well, here's what we say and here's what they say. And we submit that to the judge. And then the judge has that. Now, what does the judge do with it? Well, some accept it completely. They don't make any change. Other judges will change it. Uh, typically, though, the lawyers, at least the experienced lawyers on the other side, they know what the judges want. They know in terms of deadlines what typically uh, each particular judge wants in a case. And so normally there are not a whole lot of modifications to that order or to that report that we've submitted. Now, We'll submit to you, we'll send to you uh, the report and certainly the order that comes out. And usually we go ahead and attach kind of a summary of all the deadlines just to make it easy for you. And so as you go through your lawsuit, when you get things from us, you'll be able to refer back to this video and to the uh, slides that you have in hard copy. And that'll help you keep your place as to where are you in the process. Okay, so what happens after uh, that uh, report is, is submitted? Well, the judge will send the scheduling order. As I mentioned, we'll send that to you. And then normally, right after that report is submitted, even before the judge enters an order, both sides will send each other what's called discovery. We'll send it to them. They'll send it to us. So that takes us to step four. This is the discovery process. And this is, in most cases, the longest period of time in the case is spent in the discovery process. So first of all, well, what is discovery? That's where we get to ask questions of each other and we get to demand documents, okay? So the questions can be in writing, they can be spoken, and we'll talk about that, that's what's called a deposition. And we can say, well, hey, I want you to give me these records or these documents. And of course, the defendant can do that to you as well. So we'll take their deposition, they'll take your deposition, maybe other depositions. And so here's a critical thing. What do you need to do when you get this discovery? Well, first of all, it won't be sent directly to you. It'll come to us, and then we'll send it to you. Now. There may be questions that we see on there that are, you don't have to answer because they're improper questions. But unless we tell you that, go ahead and answer all the questions to the best of your ability and gather all the documents that possibly relate to these questions. If you're in doubt, go ahead and gather it together. Now, you may have given us all the documents. We tend to try to ask for everything that we think uh, may be relevant in the case. But there may be questions asked that uh, you realize, oh, wait, I got another box of documents. If you're in any doubt, bring us all those documents. And sometimes we have clients say, well, wh why do I have to answer these questions? These questions seem silly or I don't see how they're relevant or they're related. Well, just understand this is part of the process of being in a lawsuit. And keep in mind, both sides think that they're right. Okay, so we think we're right, or we wouldn't have filed the lawsuit, and the defendant thinks that it didn't do anything wrong, or even if it did something wrong, it shouldn't have to pay you any money, or even if it has to pay you money, it shouldn't pay as much money as you want. So both sides think that they're going to win, they're gonna, uh, that they're right, and both sides have to play by the rules. And we always want to answer the questions, provide the documents, and what we find is typically the defendant is going to refuse to answer questions, refuse to produce documents. And a lot of times this is just part of their strategy. And I've talked with defense lawyers and they say, oh yeah, this is what we do because we figure it just makes you work harder and maybe you won't hold our feet to the fire. And, and I think that's improper, but that's the approach that is typically taken. And when 
either side does not properly answer the questions, there can be some pretty serious consequences. So we always want to make sure that we answer properly and then we'll point out to the judge that the other side is playing games or they're being dishonest or they're hiding documents. And so let them be the bad guys. We want to be the good guys here. So let's talk about those consequences though. If we refuse to answer the discovery, well, judge can throw your case out. Judge can, uh, if it's a defendant doing this, there can be really bad consequences. They may lose some of their defenses. They may lose the right to uh, argue certain things in court. And whichever side is being difficult and not playing by the rules may have to pay the other side's attorney's fees. And so uh, I'll say this. We have never had a client that just says, I refuse to answer questions. Uh, we've had some clients, that's why I have this slide, that say, why do I have to do this? But just understand that this is part of the process, and when you file the lawsuit, you agreed to do this. And it's really not difficult, because all you're doing is telling the truth. And so we'll be there to help you with it. So the question is, well, how much time does it take? Well, it's going to take you a number of hours. But this is a critical part of your case. And so we want to get this part of your case right, because this is the foundation of the lawsuit what your discovery responses will be. Now, we also obviously build on uh, what the defendant provides, information, sworn testimony, but it's really critical. This is a part that you can control because you know the answers to these will help you. will help you to look at documents. will help you to understand which documents to provide, but really spend some time and focus in on this because this is very important for you to do. And so uh, we're usually asked question, well, can, can I meet with you? Well, of course, we're always going to meet with you. We're going to help you to understand what the question's asking. A lot of questions, there are improper parts to them. So we'll help you understand where well, you should answer this part, but not this other part. Where there may be legal objections and we take care of that. So uh, when you get these discovery requests, you just call us 205-879-2447, ask for Melissa to set up a meeting with you and Stan. Uh, sometimes he does that by phone, often that's in person, there may be multiple meetings. And so once we get through this what's called written discovery, and these are called interrogatories, requests for production documents, requests for admission, then we start looking at depositions is how it typically goes. So depositions, that is step number five here. So what is a deposition? That's where the lawyers get to ask questions of the other party. So, for example, when we take a deposition, we get to ask the defendant or employees of the defendant questions under oath. Well, how long does that take? Well, normally about a day. And it's about seven hours or so of actual testimony. And then the defendants get to take your deposition as well. They want to ask you questions under oath. Well, what do you need to do to get ready for when we take the deposition of the defendant? Well, we're going to get ready for that, and Stan normally takes those depositions. But here's how you can help us. We're going to ask you questions about what happened. And you may think, well, why, why do I, I need to answer that? Well. That helps us to prepare our questions. So the answers that you give us help to paint the picture of what happened. And then when we're talking to this representative or this employee of the defendant, we want to be able to ask questions to see, do they agree with your version of what happened? Do they disagree? Are they going to take absurd positions? And I'll just tell you this, a lot of times they do. You know, they take positions that I think, who in the world came up with this? You know, first of all, you need to tell the truth. But if you're not going to tell the truth, why say something so stupid and absurd? But I'm just amazed at the, and we're talking major corporations will do this. They will just flat out lie and lie in a dumb way. But hey, that's fine. They're under oath and there are consequences when they do that. And we'll talk about for you as well when you're given a deposition. So... All right, 
what happens after we take the deposition of the defendant? Well, we'll get back what's called a transcript. And that's just a written record of the deposition. Now, a lot of times we videotape the depositions because that tends to make the uh, witnesses and the defense lawyers behave better because they know that it's being captured and they don't want the jury to see them being jerks and being uh, difficult and taking absurd positions. Uh, but sometimes they still do that even when we video. But we'll send you their transcript or the video just so you can see that. But before we even do that, normally your deposition will be taken first unless the defendant's just dragging its feet not doing anything. It'll normally want to take your deposition. So this is where uh, you will be questioned under oath. Now Stan's going to get you ready for that. All right. We one time had a client say, well, am I going to be by myself in my deposition? Absolutely not. Stan will be there with you. He's going to make sure the questions are proper. If they're not proper, then he'll object to those questions. And look, this is all you have to do. Simply answer the questions truthfully. That's all you have to do. Now, Stan will prepare you for how to understand the questions, what to look out for. Sometimes lawyers will purposely ask very confusing questions. And so you'll be very well prepared. And it, it'll take some time. It may take a day. It may take two days to get you ready for deposition. But it's all time that's very well spent. Okay, so what happens after your deposition? Well, again, we typically get a copy of that transcript. We'll send that to you. And we normally ask you to look over that. If there's anything, that, uh, any mistake, or you think it was taken down wrong, let us know and we can talk about what to do next. Okay, so now once we're done with all of that discovery, and remember that's the written discovery in step four and the depositions where questions are asked uh, either in person or it can be done by video or telephone. Uh, we always do it in person and usually with a video camera as well. But once all that is done, now we're at step six. And sometimes this is called the dispositive motion stage. Well, what in the world does that mean? Well, that just means that uh, both sides have the option. They don't have to, but they have the option to file a request. And in litigation, a request is called a motion. A motion is just where you're saying to the court, okay, uh, judge, here's something I want you to do. So you make a, quote, motion that that happened. And there's something called a summary judgment. And that is where one side or both sides can say to the court, look, there's no need to go further with this. Uh, you can look at the facts and then look at the law. So we look at the facts and then the law. And then whoever's making this motion says, look, there's no way a reasonable jury could rule for the other side. Well, if there's no way a reasonable jury could rule for the other side, then the judge should just summarily enter judgment now rather than going through the time of a trial if we already know how this thing is going to end. So who can win a summary judgment or who will win? Well, Either side can win. It could be the side that's moving for the summary judgment, or it could be the side that's saying, no, 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 this needs to go to trial. Uh, both sides can move, and so one could win and the other could lose, or they both could lose the summary judgment issue. Here's the, the truth of the matter. Normally, the judge is going to say, there are facts that are in dispute, and the judge can't decide that. So let me give you an example take a simple situation of a car wreck case. Um, the two people in a lawsuit, I say I had the green light, the other side says he had the green light. Well, who had the green light? Well, the judge normally can't decide that. A jury has to decide. You have conflicting facts there. So let's take a credit reporting case. The credit bureau, Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, they'll come in and say, hey, there's no way a reasonable jury could find against us because we did everything right. Now, our response is, well, no, you didn't. You have false credit reporting. And the credit bureau will go, yeah, 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 I understand we have false credit reporting, but we were reasonable in what we did. 
Well, that's normally up to the jury. The jury will decide. You know, when the credit bureau ignores all the information you send, when they refuse to read a judge's order and they still put false information on your credit report, or you send them a letter from the creditor saying, you do not owe any money, and the credit bureau says, oh, we're going to ignore that and put down that you owe $5,000. Or a debt collector says, I never lied to you. And your testimony is, yes, you did. You lied to me. Well, a judge has to look at that and say, well, can I decide who's telling the truth? Normally, the answer is no. That goes to the jury. And that's why that discovery process, remember those are the couple previous steps here. That's why it's so critical because we're developing the evidence that we can use to show that summary judgment in favor of the defendant is not appropriate and in the right circumstance we can show that we should get summary judgment so if summary judgment is granted against us then this means that normally the case is over uh, it, now sometimes it can be a partial summary judgment but just we'll keep it simple if you lose summary judgment it means you did not go to trial and so summary judgment is really the last step before trial where either party can say, hey, judge, no reason to go to trial in this right now. Don't let a jury rule on it. Well, what if we win the summary judgment motion? In other words, the defendant debt collector says, oh, I never said those things to you, and you can't win your case. And the judge says, I'm going to deny that. Well, that means that the defendant's attempt to throw the case out has failed and we are headed to trial. Or maybe it was our motion for summary judgment that was granted. Now that means that either the entire case is over and there are situations, I'll give you an example, under the TCPA, Telephone Consumer Protection Act, those are illegal calls to typically your cell phone, could be your home phone. And in, in that situation, the damages are set at normally $500 or $1,500 per call. Well, it may be undisputed that there were 100 calls. And if we win summary judgment, then the judge is going to say, okay, well, I know the law was violated and you get $500 per call, so that's what, $50,000. Or maybe the judge will say you get... Uh, $1,500 per call. That's $150,000. But sometimes it can be a partial. So it might just be part of the case. A judge might say, look, I find that this company made 100 illegal calls to your cell phone and you get at least $500 per call. But whether you get a total of $1,500 or not, I'm going to let the jury decide that. So whatever's left for the jury, then that's what we'd... Uh, are looking at when we proceed to trial, which is step number seven, going to trial. So we get a trial date. Sometimes we get that when we get that scheduling order, if you remember back from one of the first few steps. Uh, sometimes we just get a general idea that, okay, this is going to be in the fall of next year. And then once we get through the summary judgment stage, that dispositive motion stage, then the judge will sit down with us at what's called a pretrial and say, okay, here's the actual week of trial that you're going to have. Now, there's a lot to do uh, once we get that trial date or once we know we're going to trial, and we have other information that we'll get to you at that point. But ultimately, when that trial date comes, then we go to federal court to try our case. Now, what does that mean to go to trial? Because you may have never been in a trial, and your only experience may be things you see on TV, which sometimes are accurate and oftentimes are inaccurate. But when we talk about going to trial, we mean everybody's going to be there at the courtroom. That's you, the defendant, the lawyers, the judge, and the jury. Now, both sides get to present evidence, and that's done through uh, testimony, through witnesses, through documents. Both sides get to make arguments about what does that evidence mean and how, how does that evidence fit in with the law that the judge gives. Now, the judge 
his or her role is to rule on the legal issues. And that also means, is this evidence proper? Is it improper? Uh, the procedural rules, the judge will control the court, make sure everything is functioning and operating smoothly. And then the jury will rule on the facts. So go back to a couple of examples. If it's a car wreck case, well, who had the green light? Uh, the jury will rule on what your damages are. Uh, in that TCPA context, were the calls, the illegal calls, intentional, which is what gets you the $1,500 per call. Uh, for a debt collector, you know, did they violate the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act? Uh, those affirmative defenses that we talked about that will be pled in the answer, are any of those valid? The jury will decide all that. Now, I put in here step eight, which uh, can occur before, or I mean after a trial, but normally it occurs before a trial, and that is settling your case. And uh, I'll, I'll say the settlement is the typical result. Uh, it's very rare for cases to go to trial. Now, that is in part because we uh, go into a lawsuit with the mindset that we are going to trial. And so if we prepare the case for trial, if you're committed to going to trial, we're committed to going to trial, then normally the other side senses that and they do not want to do that, so they will settle with us. But it's something that we always explore with the lawyer for the defendant. Uh, we have settled cases the day that we filed them. Um, as I'm recording this, uh, I have a case that I filed 10 days ago and we settled it yesterday. So sometimes it settles very quickly. Other times we're in the middle of trial and we settle. Or we settle the morning of trial. Or we've even settled cases after a jury verdict has been entered in our favor. So the point is we're always talking about settlement always reaching out to the other side. Are you interested? Now, they don't have to settle. There's no requirement that they do that. But if they do not settle and they are not reasonable in trying to settle with us, then again, there may be consequences uh, and we can talk about that in your particular situation. So, final thoughts. A lot of information that we could have discussed, but I just didn't want to because it would take too long or it would get this overly complicated. But I hope what we have included has been helpful to you. And if you have any questions, then just give us a call, 205-879-2447, or you can email us. Uh, if you're our client, and which typically you will be if you're watching this video, then we'll be in regular communication with you. You can ask us just whenever we're calling you or emailing you, or you just pick up the phone and call us or send us an email. So again, hope this has been helpful. Uh, any questions you have, any maybe areas that you're confused on or you have uh, some thoughts on or uh, questions about, just write those down, email them to us, call us. We can do it over the phone. We can meet with you in person. Our goal is for you to have the best possible experience going through a federal court lawsuit. And one way we do that is by making sure that we answer your questions and we keep you informed of what is going on. So appreciate you spending this time with us, and we look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks.